furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve the gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image that I made, good. But if you do not worship it, you, you do understand you'll be thrown into the blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said through the fire, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves in this matter. If we are thrown into the burning, blazing, fiery furnace, the God we serve is able. I got to pause right there for just a, just a second right there. The God we serve is able. He's able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, you got to have another level of faith to be able to say that. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, it's a preachable moment and I can't do it without you. I need your help. Speak through and to me that the words of my mouth are acceptable and pleasing in your sight and get the glory out of this moment. I need you, God, to do a magnificent work in this place to such an extraordinary degree that no one leaves here the same that they came in Jesus' name. I ask that you would transform our thinking, which will change our behaviors and ultimately change our lives. I ask that you reset the course of our circumstance and let that destiny be in alignment with your truth. Thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for this moment. You set it up. You ordered our steps to be here. And thank you for victory in all things. In Jesus' name, let every victorious heart in this place shout hallelujah, hallelujah. and amen. amen. You may be seated in the incredible presence of our God. I also want to acknowledge, before I get too far into this word, I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, our Democratic candidate for uh, judge. Uh, I want to go ahead and just say Judge Vincent Cornelius. Come on and stand. He's been here. He's spoken to us. Just we want to acknowledge his presence today. He's, he's actually a member of the greatest fraternity in the world. Amen. So glad to have him. I don't want to miss that opportunity to celebrate him. Remember that he came and he was in the primary. Re remember that, correct? Uh, he came and spoke to us. He was in the primary. Well, he won the primary, and thankfully he's on his way to the final election. Amen. Amen. The world creates larger than life images and there's not one of us who has not been consumed or caught up in the whole dynamic of, of, of looking upon these images and looking at the vastness of them looking at the magnitude of it and and seeing it as something great and something grand in this in this text and I'm gonna be real conversational here so I, just bear with me because I got to bring it all the way down to a way and in a way rather in a manner that that causes it to live for us but in the text, what you're going to see is it's a story of rescue. It's a story of faithfulness. It's a story of, of God's capacity, God's ability to step in and rescue you. Those of you who are just joining us, this series that I have been in is called Unshakable. And I've been teaching us strategies through the lives of biblical characters of how to make sure that your life is unshakable. And in order to make sure that you're able to do that, you must first understand what it is to be unshakable. To be unshakable is to be so resolved, to be so situated, to be so set, to be so entrenched that nothing will shake you from your determination. Nothing will dissuade you or persuade you to give up or abandon your position. And when you're unshakable in the things of God and in the word of God and the way of God, it causes you to be hit with everything that the enemy has to throw at you, but you're unmoved, you're, uh, you're resolved, you're unbothered. You are literally, when you're unshaken, you are unbothered. That means things can go crazy around you and trouble can come and fire can happen and you can go through some hot seasons, hot moments, and even some fiery furnaces of life, but you are so resolved that it does not bother you. And if you have not experienced hot seasons, if you haven't experienced trial and trouble, then you have just not experienced it yet. Because my grandmother used to say this, if you haven't experienced it, just keep a living, baby. 
And I didn't understand it as a child. I would hear all the senior saints and all the, uh, the elder statesmen, they would say, just keep a living, just, just keep living, just keep going. And soon enough, you're going to see it. And now I've lived long enough to be able to look behind me and say, that's what they were talking about. That there are moments in life when things go left, things go sour, things go south, things go down, when things are unpleasant, when things are just not good. Anybody been through them? There are moments in life that you can testify that if it had not been for the Lord's keeping, his grace, his mercy, his sustaining power, his, his lifting power, his healing power, his saving grace, that I would not be here right now. But by the grace of God, I'm even sitting in the sanctuary. Let's be real. If it hadn't been for the grace and the goodness of God keeping you when you didn't know that you were lost, you wouldn't be here to testify that I've been through anything. And the fact that you're here with a hand to raise is evidence that you've been through enough but you've come out of it on the other side. And whether you realize it, whether you acknowledge it, whether you'll admit it right now or not, whether you even understand the dynamics of sur that are surrounding it, it was only the grace of God that brought you this far. You got up on grace. You brushed your teeth on grace. You washed your face on grace. You put your clothes on on grace. You had a roof over your head by grace. You, you got in the car. You might have taken, somebody else might have had to given you a ride, but they gave you a ride because of the grace of God. It is grace. I used to wonder why the senior saints would shout so much when you start talking about grace and mercy, but now I understand because grace is God giving me things that I don't deserve and mercy is God not giving me what I do deserve. Grace and mercy are magnificent. And so it's not that you don't go through trials. It's not that trials won't happen. Here, here, here's, the, here's the scriptural precedent that tells us the trials are going to happen. In this life, the Bible says you shall have tribulation. Issues are going to come. Trouble is going to come. Trials are going to come. Bad days, pain, sometimes even suffering, it's going to happen. I don't care how saved you are, how long you've been in church. I don't care how much you give. I don't care what your name is. I don't care where you came from. I don't care who you are and who you think you are to yourself. You're going to have some trouble. Trouble comes. Sometimes trouble looks like an employer. Sometimes trouble looks like a supervisor. Sometimes trouble looks like a bill collector. Sometimes trouble looks like a doctor walking in the room to give you a bad prognosis and diagnosis. Sometimes trouble looks like your kids. I guess your kids are perfect in your eyes. Trouble comes and you don't expect it, you don't anticipate it, you don't know when it's coming, you don't, it doesn't announce itself, it doesn't say, hey, I'm trouble, I'm on my way. Trouble just happens. And it's, it's, it doesn't just happen to some, it doesn't just happen to those who are unsaved, it doesn't just happen to those who have not been saved as long as you have, but it happens to every single one of us. We got to get over the thing that we, we, we got this fallible concept and idea that because we are saved, because we have a relationship with Christ, that our life is charmed, that there's no issues, there's no problems that we're going to have to endure. But every single one of us has the wrestling match because the enemy roams throughout the land seeking whom he may devour. And he's no respecter of person. He's no respecter of title. He's no respecter of position. He's no respecter of your prominence in the community. He's no respecter of your position at the church. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and he does not discriminate. Red, yellow, black, and white, he comes after whomever he can capture. From the White House to the Black House. From the Super Saints House to the Crack House. He's got the same MO, the same motivation. Steal, kill, and destroy. So it's not a matter of if trouble is coming, it's when it comes. And when it comes, how do you make sure that you're positioned in such a way that you're unbothered? And that's a big statement. I don't want you to take that for granted. That's a huge statement because to be unbothered by something means that you don't flinch, that you don't move. You lose your job, but you say, well, glory to God. <laughs> yeah, that put it in context right there. That your friends stab you in the back and you say, well, to God be the glory. But you go into the doctor for a regular checkup and they come back with the worst news that you could ever have. And, they, and you say, well, God is still be praised. That's what it is to be unbothered. Is that it does not rattle you. It does not affect you. It does not offend you. It does not shake you. It doesn't bend you. And let me be real. Can we just be honest? See, some of y'all, 730, they were fronting a little bit. But I hope 1030 is a little bit more honest. Let's be honest. I don't care how saved you are. It is a struggle to remain unbothered. Can we be real? 
Okay. This section right back here, they, they, they fronting right here, so let me help y'all out. Let me sit down for one second. So in this section, let me help you get to the point where you understand this concept. So is there any point in your testimony that you're able to say, if it had not been for God, keeping my tongue, They fronting. Let me ask y'all, is there any part of your testimony that you got to say, if it hadn't been for God, keep in mind. He had to literally shut my mouth. Okay. I got there. This is their testimony. Is there anybody that can say, if it hadn't been for God, keeping me. It wasn't my tongue. He had to literally pull me back and sit down on top of me to keep me from getting up. So it is a struggle for every one of us to be unbothered, to be unshaken, to be unshakable. We all, I don't, and, and I know that we have this, 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 this fallible concept of thought and it emanates both outside the church and within the church that we as believers, sometimes we get so caught up in our Christianity that we believe that somebody should not be bothered because they're saved. <laughs> oh, it's amazing how the world will look and say, I can't believe you acted like that and you a Christian. I'm a struggling human Christian. I'm a flawed, fleshly, struggling human Christian. I am a follower of Christ, a believer of Christ, but I also recognize that I'm fighting my flesh every single day. And it's amazing that, that that's not just an ideology that exists or emanates outside of the church, but it actually it, it ruminates within the, the congregation. Because some of the saints are like, I can't believe, did you hear our pastor was talking like that? I can't believe pastor went off on them like that. Because we, th we think that, that because we're in church, because we're saved, that we're infallible. And more importantly, that we don't have to wrestle, that we don't have to fight. But here's the catch. The fight is fixed. Here's the thing. In my strength, I'm not capable of overcoming and containing my flesh. That's why I don't function, operate, and dwell on my strength. But it is the strength of God that I'm counting on, depending on, because God is a keeper. God will keep your mouth. He will keep your mind. He will keep your heart. He will keep your body. He will keep you at home. He will keep you in the right place. He will keep you in the right position. God is a keeper. In your weakness, his strength kicks in, and it is made perfect. So that's why you can't relegate or depend upon your strength. You have to think about and concentrate and focus your energies towards God's strength. Lord, if you don't help me. Lord, if you don't step in right now, ain't no way in the world I'm going to be able to pull this off. Lord, if you don't keep me, I can't keep myself. Lord, if you don't hold me, Lord, if you don't support me, Lord, if you don't, if you don't, hold, if you don't keep me, if you don't lift me, if you don't raise me, I'm not going to be able to do this. So I need your help. Some of us are so prideful that we, we forget to ask God for his help. You, you, you got to be able to ask God for his help. I saw something on social media this week. It was a little girl and, and her mom, she likes spicy food, and, and the mom was eating some wasabi. Anybody know what's wasabi? Everybody know what wasabi is? It's Japanese, like horseradish. It's hot as hot as hot as hot. And so the little girl uh, was, was trying to get some of mommy's food, and she wanted some of that wasabi. And so mommy's like, you want some of this? She's like, no, no, no. And then she said, wasabi, wasabi. She's like, you want some? She's like, yeah. And so the little girl took it and she just did a little bit right there on her teeth, just a little bit on the tip of her tongue. And the little girl smacked her lips a little bit. And the next thing you know, she said, help. <laughs> I watched it 10 times. It was hilarious. Wasabi. She's like, you want some? Okay. That's something I would have done. <laughs> okay. You want it? Okay. And the, the three, about three seconds later, the little girl's like, help. <laughs> Some of you all have been handed hot things in life. 
hot situations, hot circumstances, hot button items, hot topics, hot moments, heated sessions, heated seasons. You need to learn how to look at God and say, One of the reasons that we don't ask God for the help that we need is because we're so prideful. Because we're so egotistical, because we're so self-centered, we're so dependent that we do not learn, we have not learned how to depend on God. And in your own dependency, you keep failing yourself. Let me tell you where you're failing yourself. And one of the ways that this, this story shapes and, and chronicles our failures is through the exemplification and the exhibition of idols. We failed ourselves and we failed to ask God for what he need, for what we need and failed to honor him and even acknowledge him for who he is because we are so idolatry centered now. Even as a, as a community, as a people, as a culture, we, we, are, we are probably the most, idolat the, the, the most uh, idolatrous culture that has existed throughout the course of time. I, I mean, and that's a, that's, a, that's a huge statement. That's a massive Massive statement because idol worship was perpetuated from the beginning. I mean, you think about Baal, the, 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 the god that they worshipped, or, uh, or all of the, the Balaam, or all of the ones that, they, they, that, that existed and that they worshipped even back in the Old Testament. But to say that about our cultural context really is offensive to some people because you don't even realize what idolatry is and you don't even realize you're participating in it. And here these boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are positioned, and they're given this opportunity to worship an idol God, but because of their upbringing, train up a child in the way that he should go. As teenage boys, they've learned God enough. They've been with God enough. They've, they've made a decision to follow God at, at such a definitive degree. They're unshaken, unmoved, and unbothered by what's being presented to the extent that they resolve, we will not worship those idol gods. We're only going to serve God. King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is given this task and this responsibility of carrying out his law that he put into place, the edict and the decree that has been handed to them. But they made a decision that mm -mm, we're not going to do that. We will not bow down and we will not worship other gods. It, it, it's, it's something to be that resolved and be that committed, that even in the face of adversity, even in the face of death, because the pending uh, responsibility of these men would be that they would have to be executed in a fiery furnace. But they had made a decision. I don't care what everybody else says. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it feels like. We're not going to worship idol gods. And, and, and some of you, if I take a poll, I'm not even going to embarrass you and put you on front street because I could ask, how many of you are committed that you will not worship an idol god? Everybody in the building will be like, amen, pastor. No way in the world I'm going to worship no idol god. I will not worship idols. But here's, here's the thing. I, idolatry has become so cloaked that many of us don't even realize we have become idolaters. <laughs> See, the world creates these larger-than-life images, and these larger-than-life images, let me first of all define idolatry. An idol is anything. An idol is anything. Now, this is going to hurt you. Or anyone that you place before God. Sit on it for a few minutes. Go through the Rolodex of your own experiential knowledge. Anything or anyone that you place before God is an idol. Are you with me? So celebrities have become idols to us. We even got a show on TV called American Idol. You'll even hear people say, oh, you're my idol. No, 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 no. Because now you have become an idolater because you just said that I am your idol. I am the one that you place before God. And so you got to even be careful about the vernacular and the terminology that you use because it can, it can literally begin to invade the, the expressions of your heart and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And ultimately, your mind is inextricably tied in that process. So ultimately, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So you do not want to pronounce yourself an idolater or an idol worshiper by even using terminology that speaks to it. Oh, this is going to be a tough crowd. It's all right. I'm coming down. <laughs> Athletes, celebrities. Let me give you an example. If a celebrity came in, if Steph Curry came in, or if you're, if you're, uh, if you're, if you're with the enemy team, if LeBron James came in, in this sanctuary. We're going to get you saved before the end of this service. Though. But if one of them 
either of them walked in and sat down somewhere in the sanctuary, nobody would be focusing on the word anymore. Everybody would be. When you have God's mouthpiece presenting you the truth of who he is and what he has to speak into your life, a life-giving, life-altering, life-changing word, but you'll be so caught up in the idol. You'll worship the idol. You know, when I first got in the music business, I, I was just like everybody else. I was starstruck and I was a fan of everything and everybody. I said, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And my wife used to tell me all the time, you're not a fan. You're not a fan. I said, no, but do you know what that is? You're not a fan. You're not a fan. So finally, I kept saying, well, I, I asked her one day, because she would say it every time. I mean, because I think she would, didn't want me to embarrass her. I think that's part of the problem. It's like, oh, my God, do you know who you are? You're not a fan. <laughs> one day, I asked her, why do you keep telling me I'm not a fan? She's like, because I, I need you to understand that they people just like you are. <laughs> and they function just like you function. And they do like you do. You're just as important as they are. I, was saying, I said, well, say it then. <laughs> she didn't have to tell me twice. I walked in, I'm not a fan. <laughs> How y'all doing? Good, good to see y'all. Hey, Oprah, I'm not a fan. God bless you. God bless you. We're easily drawn into making people bigger than life. And anything that you make so big, bigger than life, anything that you make so, so, so big that it will distract you from the truth of who God is and what God... See, we'll excuse people's behavior because they're so big as in, bigger than life. I know this one going to be popular. I brought a few amens. Preach, boy. You see, celebrities, here, here's the other thing. Anything or anyone, your jobs. Some of you have made your job an idol. You're more focused and concentrating. You put more effort and energy into your job, into your employment, than you do into your, your relationship with Jesus Christ. You know more about the rules, the procedures, the policies. You know exactly what time you can get in and still not be docked, what time you can take off, or how many times you can take off, but you don't know Genesis 1 and 1. Well, according to the rule book, Statute number 158 on page 16, I can take off three times. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know it. No, 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 you're not correct. The policy, I've been, I brought, I, I brought stuff to, back to the store before. The policy is I got 15 days, I, I'm on my 14th day and 6th hour. You can't tell me, but you can't tell me what the Bible has to say about your faith, about your healing, about your deliverance, about your salvation, about your... <laughs> Idolatry. You can even become an idol worshiper when you start worshiping your own wishes over God's will. It's more about your convenience. It's more about your comfort. This is what's amazing to me, how people can come to church, and church is more about your convenience than it is about your, 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 your creation or, or getting to know your creator. If, if it's not comfortable, if it's not convenient. I see some of y'all fanning today. We having some problems with the electrical stuff. Some of y'all fanning today, you talk, ooh, I can't even focus. It's so hot up in here. Oh, my God. You've allowed your personal comfort and your convenience to get in the way of you receiving. Do you not understand that the enemy is the master of distraction? He will distract you with conditions because the conditions take you away from the creator and you can no longer know the truth. And God is trying to give you a roadmap and a strategy for your next destination. But you'll miss it because you're caught up in your conditions. Your comfort and your convenience have become more important than your creator. Oh, this is good. Remember when they had church? Well, I don't know if y'all had it up here, but down south, they didn't have no air conditioning. They opened up the, the windows, and you was really doing good if you had a fan. They had them fans with Martin Luther King and that black family that everybody in the country had on the same fan. And nobody complained, nobody budged. 
Nobody moved, and they shouted, they danced, they cried, they worshiped. They didn't have all this instrumentation. They had their feet. They, they, they stomp on the floor to make a rhythm in the building, and before you know it, somebody in the back would cry out, I'm a soldier. But nobody complained because it was about what they came to get, what they came to give, not what they came to receive. God, what do you have for me today? What can you tell me that's going to cause me to be able to go through the fire this week? What can you give me that's going to cause me to be able to go through the fire on my job, the fire in my house? There's a fire brewing all around me. I'm walking through the fire. It's hot, and I cannot get through it unless I have you with me. And they were not afraid. No, they were there ashamed to stop everything and say, help. We've gotten too caught up in our idols. Your schedule is an idol. You worship your schedule more than you. You worship social media more than you worship God. Oh, Jesus, help me. You're more consumed with Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook and all the other social outlets than you are with finding time for prayer. God says, can I get some FaceTime? You're giving Facebook all your time. Can I get some FaceTime? When was the last time you had a prayer life? There's a difference between you praying and having a prayer life. A prayer life is a lifestyle. But everything else has become more important than God. I'm, I'm going to even talk about this because I, I, I just feel it. Y'all have to look over me. Y'all guess, and I so want y'all to know y'all are welcome here. But some people make their fraternities and their sororities and their, and their other organizations and their charitable thing. You make that more important than your God. But yet you say you stand on biblical principles. Thank you, Holy Ghost. See, when, you, when you're walking in divine authority, you ain't got to be scared to say it. Because at the end of the day, truth will stand whether we want to stand with it or not. And I know, lest you think that all of the idols are external. Let me, let me hurry through this. Let me, let, lest you think that all the idols are external. Many of you are tempted to create a false, create a false image of yourself to impress other people. So you become your own idol. You're more consumed with what is, 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 is making other people happy and making other people think good of you. So you, you have literally become an idol in your own eyes. You, you, ought, to, you ought to post what you really look like. You, you, you need to act like you post to be. But you're so consumed with, with presenting an image that causes people to think one way about you. But at the end of the day, you are now are, are so, you, you're so caught up in what other people think that you've forgotten to ask God, what do you think? Is what I'm wearing okay with you? Are you pleased? Am I, am I doing what is in your will? Am I operating in a, in a principle that makes you look good? Am I causing people to want to know you more? Am I causing people to want to get closer to you? Or is it about me? How many likes did I get? What well, did you get that like? Did you get the one that counts? Did you get the one that really matters? Is God, is God really caught up in your sexiness? Or is he looking for your substance? But we're, we're so consumed. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were able to stand in the face of the king and tell the king, no, we're not going to bow down and worship your other gods because they had done what we need to do. Some of you need to get over your desire and your need to be light. That's a difficult thing. Because understand, there's not one of us who doesn't have a moment that we really want people to like us. But if you're not able to stand in the face of adversity and know that your stance might cause people not to like you, then you're not going to ever be to a place of unshakableness or, or being unshaken. If you're going to ever be unshaken, you've got to be unbothered. And to be unbothered means I really don't care if you like me. Uh, I I know this wasn't going to be popular preaching, especially at 10 o'clock, because some of y'all really, y'all social media heavy in 10 o'clock service. Oh, I see all of your 10 o'clock posts. But, but watch this. It is better to be respected than liked. 
you don't have to like me, but I really need you to respect me. Because what happens is likes, if you don't do what the person wants you to do, guess what? They no longer like you. And if your whole life is predicated upon likes or whether somebody likes you, you just lost your whole life. But when you have respect, they can stop liking you, but they still... They got to respect your position. They got to respect. See, and, and, this, and this is the thing. When people know that you don't get down with foolishness, they don't bring foolishness to you because they respect you enough to know that foolishness does not operate in your sphere of influence. Garbage is only deposited in a receptacle that's willing to receive it. Whenever you, listen, I love, I love, love my kids and I'm so proud of them I'm so proud and I'm not saying they're perfect please don't make mistakes about that I'm very clear to know that they're human and they're children but my son did something incredible this week he went to a party and and he's driving now and so uh, uh it's a it's a different experience for me parents you can relate it's like you're going where Oh, okay. You know, there was a time when I dropped them off. We walked to the door. I saw who was in the house. I spoke to the parents. I said, all right. I'll be back to pick them up at this time. But when they start driving, it's like, how long are you going to be there? Well, who going to be? Who, who going to be? Who? 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 Who going to be over there? Where the mom and dad are going to be? It's in the house. What floor of the house? If I fall up over there, what level are you going to be on? You know, so it's a different experience. And so my, my son called, and, and he called, and he, he went to the thing, and, you know, I praise God. People are, people are you, know, m you know, mysteriously trying to figure out what kind of car I got. I mean, none of your business. But I did get one. I'll tell you this. I did get one that's got this special button. It's called Locate. I hit that Locate button. I said, all right, I see you. All right, you where you said you was going. Amen. I see how fast she was going. All right, look at God. <laughs> a few minutes later, he called me. He said, Dad, I had to leave. I left the party. I said, yeah, I saw. I mean, oh, you did? <laughs> Where you go? <laughs> he said, well, I just, I just didn't feel right. I didn't, I didn't feel right about it, and so I grabbed my friends and so them, like, like, let's go, and we're just going to go grab a bite at McDonald's. It just, it, it wasn't a good atmosphere. There was some stuff going on that I wasn't okay with. I just didn't feel good about it. He said, so I just left. He said, and while I was pulling off, he said, I was at the stoplight at the corner. While I was pulling off, the police was pulling in. You may call me anything you want to call me, and you may not like me because I don't do what it takes to fit in. Because I'm not going to assimilate into your environment, and I'm okay with you not liking me. But guess what? You still going to have to respect. You're going to have to put some respect on my name. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, you put some respect on my name. Y'all so proper. Put some respect on my name. If I reject the world's idols, I need you to get this because he, idols are everywhere. And I had to break that down. I spent a lot of time on that because I want to make sure you understand that idols don't look like what you think they look like. That idols are not these big, huge statues that are in the middle of town. They're not golden calves. They're not, they're, they're, your idols are in your hand. They're your phones. Your, your idols can be on your hair. You worship your hair. It's more consumed with your hair. I can't go to church today because my hair ain't right. <laughs> I don't know where that came from in the Holy Ghost. I can't go to church today because my hair ain't right. But you went to work and your hair was toe up. <laughs> Wrapped it right on up. Put a little ugly bow on the top. It's a bad hair day. <laughs> Y'all be making me act up. We got company today. Come on, stop that. We got to come. But I want you to understand this. When they, re when they rejected the, the notion, we're not going to bow down and worship these idol images. I want you to watch this. If I reject the world's idols, watch this, people will try to burn you. 
I don't want you to miss this because whenever you decide that you're not going to assimilate, when you're okay not being liked, well, girl, they're going to talk about you. You know they're going to be mad and they're going to have to be mad. They'll respect me even if they don't like me. They can talk me about me. He thinks he's better than everybody else. They think they're all that. She thinks she's something else because she got this because she got that. No, at the end of the day, you don't have to like me, but you're going to have to respect me. So when you make that decision, I need you to understand that people are going to try to burn you. King Nebuchadnezzar said, you know, if you don't bow down, I'm going to have to burn you. I'm going to have to throw you into the fiery furnace. You know you're going to be consumed by the fire. And you've got to be to a place in your faith where you're able to say, well, burn me. Do what you got to do. Say what you got to say. Be mad. Be angry. I'm going to love you. I'm going to pray for you. I'll even pray with you if you like. But at the end of the day, I have to be resolved and understand within myself. And this is the, this is the decision you got to make today, that when you decide to stand for God, the enemy is going to try to turn the heat up. And doing the right thing always makes some people mad. Somebody is going to be angry. It's the enemy's strategy. It's his tactic. It's meant to keep you in bondage. It's meant to keep you hostage so you keep making wrong decisions because you're trying to appease people instead of please God. Because you've made yourself an idol. Now you're more consumed with everybody liking you than you are with God loving you. Am, am I preaching good to anybody? Okay. I'll tell you this. I'm sure helping myself. So what should I do when the heat is turned on? Since you're saying, Pastor, that the heat is coming, it will be turned on, that it's going to be hot seasons, there are going to be hot moments, that when the enemy finds out that I'm not going to bow down and worship the idol gods, that I will serve God, that I will be pleasing to God, that I will be unmovable, unshaken, and unbothered. When I make my mind up, the heat is going to come on. So, Pastor, what should I do when the heat is turned on? I'm so glad you asked. First thing you need to do is don't worry about defending yourself. In, in Daniel, the third chapter, the 16th verse, then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves in this matter. In other words, what they resolved is, is the words of the verbiage of 2 Chronicles 20 and 15, which says, For the battle does not belong to me, but it belongs to my God. I don't care how many armies are encamped around me, this battle don't belong to me. And so you've got to make up in your mind that this battle is bigger than me. And this battle is not a battle that I have to win. As long as I am on the side of righteousness, then that's when God is going to uphold me. And in my obedience to him, he's going to protect me. He's obligated to do it because he said so in his word. Are y'all with me? So you've got to know that you've got a God that says, I am your defense attorney. I am the one that is able to do it. Listen, there was a man that was standing before the judge. The judge was on the bench and he was clothed in his robe. The man was guilty of what, what he was being accused of. But the, the man sat there accused and he, and he had no, the, the enemy came through and, and said, listen, you, you are guilty of all of these sins. And when he sat there on the defense table, he, he literally was guilty of everything that was on the list. God sat there on the seat of judgment and says, hold on one minute. I'm going to do this for you, but I'm only going to do it this time. He stood up on the bench, took off his robe, put his robe on the chair, stepped down, came and sat beside the defendant at the defendant table and said, I'm only going to be able to do this for you this time, but I'm going to be your defense attorney and I'm going to make your case for you against the enemy, which is your accuser. That's the same thing that God did. God took off his robe, stepped down to the defense table, and he put on the clothes called Jesus Christ and sat down beside him and said, I can only do this for you once, but I'm going to make a case and I'm going to make it in blood. I'm going to make a case and plead this case so that the devil, your false accuser of the brethren, will once and for all be defeated. You got to recognize that you got a God who will defend you. And he'll defend you through the power of his own son, Christ Jesus. Listen, in September the 11th, 2001, more than 3,000 people died. The towers in New York City came down, the trade, the World Trade Center. But a few of those who were buried beneath the rubble, they actually miraculously survived. Two of these individuals were named Will Jamino and John McLaughlin. 
a pair of Port Authority employees who responded to the attacks and were at the bottom floor of the South Tower when it began to fall. They raced to an elevator shaft and amazingly they survived with 100 stories collapsing all around them. And they were buried dozens of feet beneath the array of all of the rubble. They were trapped without water. They were trapped without food. They were trapped without air. The air quality was filled with smoke. And literally, there was little hope for them to survive. And yet, as they lay there, pinned under a mountain of debris, something was stirring on the inside in an accountant who was sitting at his desk in Connecticut that they had never met, never talked to, never seen. And Dave, the accountant, got up from his desk, went to a barbershop after watching the news and seeing everything that everybody else saw playing out on television. And he asked for a, hair and, a, a, a high and tight haircut. Then he stopped by his house and put on his army fatigues, hoping that the uniform would allow him access to the blocked off area surrounding Ground Zero. And he drove from Manhattan, drove rather to Manhattan at speeds of 120 miles per hour. And finally, later that afternoon, he arrived. While rescuers were being called off of the wreckage, the pile of danger, had begun to surmount. Dave was able to stay because of the clout that he had or the credentials that he had in his military uniform. And, 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 and finding another Marine nearby, the two men walked the pile of, of the rubble together trying to find somebody that was seeking to save anybody that was lost beneath. And after an hour of searching, they heard a faint sound of yelling and tapping on a pole. And Will and John, who had been trapped now for nine hours, by that time completely incapable of working themselves free, yet in the midst of the rubble, a Marine who earlier in that same morning had been working on a spreadsheet at his office desk in Connecticut, he found them. Of the 20 people pulled from the wreckage, all that was heaped up, the remains of the World Trade Center. Will and John were numbers 18 and 19. And all because Dave Carnes took off his suit, put on his army fatigues, stepped into the despair and the darkness of ground zero and decided that it was worth him getting in the muck and the mire to try to figure out how he could save somebody that was lost. In the same way, God took off his robes, stepped into the darkness of our world and, de and the depravity of our own culture, and he looked for us until he heard us crying out from beneath all that had been on top of us. He listened for our voice, and when he heard our voice, he said, don't worry, we're about to get you out of it. We're about to get you out of your debt situation. We're about to get you out of your sickness. We're about to pull you out of your pain. Well, God, who is we? Well, I'm the only one here, but I'm an ambassador of the Father. Father, the Son, and I even brought the Holy Ghost. I put on my uniform. I wrapped myself in flesh. I wrapped myself in glory so I could hear you. Help! Help! I love the Lord because he heard my cry and he pitied every one of my groans. God is a rescuer God is a savior God is a redeemer God is a keeper God is a rescuer I don't have to defend myself God's got me covered sit down sit down sit down I'm done remember you don't have to defend yourself but I need you to understand this is why because God has power to save you I know there's a lot of people that want to do something for you. They want to save you. They want to rescue you. They want to help you, but they don't have the power to do it. God has the power to save you. I, I got excited when I read this. It says, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we worship is able. <laughs> the God we serve is able. You, you know, they said it like they had experiential knowledge, like he had rescued them from some stuff before. The God we serve is is able 
He has the capacity. He has the ability. He has the power. He has the strength. He has the might. Well, well, what kind of power? What kind of power do I have uh, uh, to 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 go through the fire? To be put into a fiery situation? What kind of proxy of his power did he extend to me? I'm glad you asked. Y'all asked the best question at 10 o'clock service. <laughs> go to Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 18 through 23. Come on, right quick, because my time is almost up. Ephesians 1, 18 through 23. Ephesians 1, 18 through 23. Listen, read it with me. It says. I pray that, now read it aloud, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Stop. Now, you see the prerequisite. The prerequisite is for who? Say it one more time. Tell your neighbor, they're a little slower. Tell them, no child left behind. We got you. The power is reserved for whom? For us who believe. But I'll put it back up. Put it back up. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. It is reserved for us who believe. It is reserved for who? Okay, that doesn't get you excited, but this should get you really excited because I need you to understand what kind of power, because you believe, what kind of power you got access to. Some of you really can't get excited because you don't know what kind of, you when you hear power all you think about is like I got a plug I can plug it into the socket and it's going to charge my phone. You hear power you think my battery has power in my car. If I turn it it turns over and it'll start my engine. You think I have power because the light system is now connected with this grid, this power grid, and there's a transformer and a power station that's sending energy into my household, and so my lights will work, so my electronics will work. That's what you think of when you think of power, but I need you to take it a step further because the power that you have access to is greater than any power that you can harness in, in earthly means or through man's D dynamics so so watch what what kind of power do I have pastor what kind of power did he invest in me what is the inheritance of power that he has given to me what is the richness of authority that he has invested in my hand here it is here's your power this is the power that you have access to if you believe watch this read on that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead That's the power that you have access to and is at your disposal. So what are you afraid of? What are you trembling for? What are you intimidated by? When you've got the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that he has invested as an inheritance into your life just because you believe in him. And you have the audacity to be intimidated. To be afraid. You have the audacity to waver because you, you're afraid that people won't like you. You're afraid that you, you won't, you won't, I, I, if I do this, then I'm not going to be able to keep my job. Listen, these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego looked at King Nebuchadnezzar and said, not, not if I do this, I'm not going to keep my job. I won't keep my life. That's how committed they were. That's how re resolved they were that I'm not going to bend. I stand for God and God stands for me. So, you know. That he, he is a defender. You know that he has given you power. But everybody that has power won't use it for you. God will. It's not that he's able, just that he's able to save you. But he's also willing to save you. It says, and he will save us. Even from your hand, O king. So we're not worried about it. We know that it's just a stress test. In order for God... To be able to make sure that we're qualified to handle and to hold what we're about to come into. He has to go through it. He has to take us through a stress test to make sure we can handle what we want to hold. Some of you have been praying and asking God to give you something, but you can't even handle it if he gave it to you to hold it. i never forget my grandmother, my great-grandmother. She was a cook. Her old, wrinkled, weathered hands were always super tender and super soft. And so I would always look at her hands and mess with her hands. And one day we were in the kitchen. She taught me how to cook. 
And I don't know why and or how, but my grandmother could grab anything, I don't care how hot it was, and it would not phase her. She didn't blink. She didn't jump. She would handle pans and skillets, and she would grab the handle of hot pans, and, and I would think that because she grabbed it, I must be able to grab it too. And I would come behind her, and I'd put my hand on the skillet and immediately say, hey, that's hot. And I would ask, how are you able to pick that up? She says, I've been through enough fire. These hands have been weathered and they've gone through enough fire that now I'm not sensitive on my fingertips like some people are. I've had them weathered long enough that when I touch stuff now, it doesn't hurt me. And so what God is trying to do, he says, I've got something for you to hold, but I need to make sure you can handle it before I let you hold it. Thank you, Holy Ghost. God says, don't worry about it because when you go through the deep waters, and great trouble, I will be with you. Isaiah 43. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you won't drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned. The flames are not going to consume you. For I am the Lord your God, and I'm with you. But here's the prerequisite. God, I want all of that. I want your power. I want your willingness to come in and help me. I want your promise. I want, I want the provision. I want the protection. I want everything. Give me the whole package. They'll just sign me up. Put me on all my benefits together. He says, I'm glad to do that, but here's the prerequisite. You've got to get to the point in your faith. And this is hard. It's, it's challenging. Can I be real? It's real challenging. But you've got to get to the point when, you, when you're able to look. And it takes maturity. It takes maturity, and it takes an, a strength in faith. You've got to get to the point where you're able to say, I want this to happen. God and your power, I desire that you make this happen. I, I, want, I want to be rescued. I want to be saved. I want to be, I want to be pulled out of it. I want to be elevated, increased. I want to be promoted. I want to be positioned. But even if you don't, I'll still praise you. But even if you don't heal me, I'll still bless you. But even if you don't bring me through it, I still worship you. But even if it don't work out the way that I want it to work out, I'll still acknowledge you who, as, as my Lord of Lords. But even if you don't, see it takes a spiritually mature individual who is ready to hold the next level to be able to say, God, this is my prayer. I've been pleading with you for years. I've been crying about it. I've been hoping for it. I've been waiting on it. I've, been, I've had people to prophesy about it. I've been, I've been waiting. I've been faithful. I've been diligent. I've been on my face and I've been asking you, Lord, I need you to do it. But even if you don't, you got to be mature in your faith. And that's what God is trying to see. He's trying to see, can I trust you to be able to handle what I'm about to let you hold? If you can't be able to stand your ground on this level, then if I let you hold something on the next level, it's going to kill you. My glory is weighty. My grace and my favor is heavy. So if you're not strong enough to handle it on this level, he says, if you're faithful over a few things. Some of you have been faithful over a few. I feel it in the Holy Ghost. You've been faithful over a few things. God sent this sermon as your commencement address. This is your graduation ceremony. You've been showing God for many years that you can handle it on this level. And he's about to let you hold something on another level. Increase is coming. In the name of Jesus, favor is about to overtake your household in such a magnificent way that the enemy is going to have to scratch his head and figure out how did he live. Lose this battle. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord God. This is your commencement address. This is your commencement address. This is your graduation speech. That tomorrow is going to be greater. You passed. It hurt. The hot heat almost took you out. You passed. You passed. You passed. You passed. You passed. Pastor, how can you say I passed? Let me tell you how I know you passed. Because we've got an enemy who is good at evidence tampering. 
He'll come in and he'll mess with the evidence to try to make it look like it's something that is not and that it's not something that it is. But the fact that you're here today with breath in your body, that you rolled out of the bed, that you turned on your device, that you scooted into the sanctuary and you're still alive means that God said you pass. Now you're ready to handle what I'm about to let you hold. New levels, new joy, new abundance, new peace, new increase, new favor, new relationships, new doors, new fa- I wish I had somebody that would get excited that you're graduating to die. I passed. With the hell that I've been through, you understand that I should have been. I would have been. I could have been. I should have been. I would have been. I could have been. I should have been. I would have been. And I could have been. But God. But God. But God. But God. Every time I turned around. But God. I passed. Some of my friends didn't make it, but I passed. Some of my family couldn't make it, but I passed. Here's the, here's the thing. You got to get to the point in your faith where you're able to say, but even if he don't. Some of you have been buried under the rubble so long that you felt like God had forgotten you. You felt like all hope was gone. It was a wrap for you. you. You thought, this is it. That's it. I'm done. Nobody cares about me. Nobody even paying attention to what I'm dealing with. Everybody expects me to keep going, but they don't understand I'm about to fall out and throw in the towel. They don't, they don't know how close I am to saying, forget about it. But I need you to understand this. The enemy has not been attacking you. The heat has not been so hot so that he can take your money. He doesn't care about your money. He doesn't care about your job. A lot of people will say, oh, the enemy is busy on my job. They're trying to, he's trying to take my, no. He don't care about your job. The enemy doesn't care about your marriage. He knows that if you leave this marriage, you can get in another one. And he's going to attack you there too. He's not consumed about your kids. Oh, he, just wants to, he just wants to kill my kid. The enemy is after my kids. No. I don't want you to miss this. The enemy roams throughout the land seeking whom he may devour. To devour means to utterly and totally consume so that there is no evidence that you ever even existed. So the only way that he can devour you, listen, if he just takes your money, he still leaves evidence. If he takes, if he takes your marriage, you still live. He leaves evidence. Well, God kept me through the divorce. It was rough. It was painful. It was dark. It was hard, but he kept me. That's still evidence. If he just attacks your children, you're able to say, but God kept them even when they were on the streets, when they were on drugs, when they were in the crack house. God sent his grace and his mercy. He dispatched angels that they at least didn't die in the situation. That's evidence. So let me tell you what he's trying to what he's after he's not after all that stuff this is what he's after the enemy is trying to kill your faith he's trying to make you doubt God doubt who God is doubt God's power doubt your authority in God's power doubt your capacity to make it he's trying to get you to doubt God because he's figured out what you haven't even realized for yourself Hebrews 11 and 6 says without faith it is what it is impossible. God doesn't speak a lot about impossibility because he knows, he said, with him, all things are possible. Without him, nothing is possible. So what he's trying to kill is your faith because he knows that that makes it impossible for you to please God. 
If he kills your faith, it don't matter how important you think you are, how much money you have. It doesn't matter how many children fill your coffer. It doesn't matter how many, how many people celebrate your name. It doesn't matter your prominence, your title, your position. If he can kill your faith, you still don't have the capacity to be pleasing to God. You can have everything in the world that anybody could ever want. But if you don't have faith, you cannot. It is impossible for you to be a pleasing, to be pleasing to God. So that's why he's after your faith. You've been hurting a long time. You've been dealing with it a long time. You've been in a hot place a long time. The enemy threw you in the furnace. It was just God allowing it to happen so he could take you through a stress test to make you realize, I'm in it with you. Don't worry about it. I got you. When they look in, they ain't going to just see you. They're going to see me with you. When they came out of the fire, they didn't smell like smoke. Everything was singed that was holding them. So God allowed the fire so it could burn off everything that wasn't supposed to be attached to you. Thank God they left you. Thank God they hurt you. Thank God they betrayed you. Thank God they stabbed you in the back because he had to burn off everything that was holding you. And he says, I've not forgotten you. I haven't forgotten you. I'm still with you. Even through the fire right down to the wire he says I'm still with you I just need you to get to a place in your faith where you are unshaken unbothered where you're committed to say it didn't work out the way I wanted it to but even if it doesn't I'm still going to give you glory I'm still going to honor you I'm still going to praise you. I'm still going to serve you. I'm still going to be faithful. I'm still going to walk by faith and not by sight. I'm still going to trust you. I'm still going to believe that it's going to work out for my good. All things, not all good things, but all things work together for the good. All things. I'm still going to believe you. I'm still going to hope against hope. I'm still going to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I'm still going to be here. I'm still going to give you glory. I'm still going to put you first. I'm still going to seek you above everything else. I know it hurts. I feel your pain today. I feel your pain. But you're going to have to let it go and say, God, I need you now. need you now oh, I need you now Lord I need you now hey, 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 hey. I don't want to wait another second or another minute Jesus not an hour of another day Lord at this moment with my arms outstretched I need you in my home right now oh God I need you in my body right now, Jesus. I need you. Oh, in my marriage right now, oh God, I need you. In my finances right now, Jesus. I need you in my heart right now, God. I need, I need you, I need you, I need you, I need you, I need. It's me. God, and I'm not ashamed to say I need you to make a way. As he has already done so many times before. Think about it. Sometimes it was through a window or a barely open door. So, Father, we stretch. Come on, we who are not ashamed to say, God, we need help. 
is bigger than me. Come on, get as high as you can on your feet towards heaven right now. Stretch out on him. Some of you been cute, you've been leaning on him, but I dare you to just go on and lay on him. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Father, we stretch our hands to thee. I'm telling you, he's a God that will. He's able and he will. Just ask him, please come and rescue me. He knows what you're dealing with. He knows what you're going through. He knows what the devil has done. He sees the fire turned up hotter. Just ask him right now, Lord, please come and rescue me. Because I need you right. That may not be your flavor, so take it to old school and say, I need the old. Ask him for what you're in need. Lift up your eyes to the hill. Every hour. Oh God, oh God. I need, I need the oh, oh, oh bless me now, my. Now here's the test. Here's the test. Here's the test. It's just a test of the emergency praise system. Yeah. If this had been the real thing, the trumpets would have sounded. The sky would have rolled back like a scroll. The dead in Christ would have been arising and we who remain would have been caught. It's just a test of the emergency praise system. I need somebody, even if he does not, saints, to give God praise in advance. Like it's all ready. Oh, come on and bless him like you got it. Praise him like it's in the bank. Thank him like it's on the way. Thank God like you're healed from it. Bless his name in this place. Release a sound to heaven right now. The atmosphere. Change your circumstance. Somebody give him glory. Oh, bless his name. Bless his name. Oh, bless his name. Bless his name. It's graduation day. Turn your tassel to the other side because God is about to elevate and increase you. This is the last day. This is the last season. You're about to go from another level, from glory to glory, from glory to glory. I'm so happy for you. I feel a release in the atmosphere. Yokes just got destroyed. Bondage just got broken. You've been holding back. You've been cute with it. You've been playing with God. You've been worshiping everything but God. But I feel a release in the atmosphere. This is a turning point. 
This is a shift in your life. Lord, I thank you for what you've done in this place. I thank you for the release that you're giving to somebody's life right now. I thank you that they're no longer going to struggle and think that they're struggling by themselves. That you reminded them that you got in the fire the moment the fire was turned up. And that everybody that pushed them will be consumed. And everything that held them back will be consumed. But God, you promised that you were a keeper. And that you would save them. You've been waiting to see if they can handle what you want them to hold. Thank you for your patience with us. As we put our faith and our confidence and our trust and our hope and our worship in other things. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for still honoring us through grace and mercy. Thank you for still favoring us with your goodness. And God, for that man, that woman, that boy, that girl who's been under a pound of rubble, let them hear the sound of the tapping on the poles right now. Let them hear, God, that somebody has climbed over the rubble and they're looking for them. That all of the people that were searching have not walked off the pile, but there's still one who took off his robe in glory, stepped into time and wrapped himself in flesh and called his name Jesus. And that he's walking over the pile of rubble of depression and heartache and heartbreak and anxiety and stress and sickness and pain that, that is not too big for him, but he's, he's not going to give up because everybody else turned around and went home. It's not too dangerous for him because he's the authority. He's omnipotent and all-powerful over all things. And so God, let them be reminded now that he's walking over the rubble trying to find them. And all they need to do is cry out to him. And when they cry out to him, he will hear their cry and meet them at every point of their need. Push them to a place today. Graduate them to a place today where they're able to say, like Romans 8, like Romans 10, 9, and 8 says, that they confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that you are their Lord and that you were raised from the dead so that they can receive the salvation that you're here to give them. Save them from eternal damnation and hell. Save them to eternity in heaven and save them into abundant life even right now. Help them, God, to realize there's only one way and it's through Christ Jesus. Push them into your promise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're here today and you know that you're ready to say yes to God, and you know you want God and you're ready to say, God, I need your help. I can't live this thing without you. Can't be victorious as a Christian without you. I need you. Come now. The doors are open. 